Uh, so hi, just a happy new year. My name is Andrea Coronado. I'm the Development and Communications Director uh, for Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. New to the team here, just joined this past year. Um, I'll be facilitating today's Icebreaker Speaker Series. Um, we have about 100 people registered today, and hopefully we have more joining us as, as we begin here. Um, so when we get to the Q&A portion of this program, um, we may have to limit our, our Q&A uh, panel or section just to keep our presentation to an hour, um, but we'll see how, how this uh, timing goes. Um, thanks for joining us for today's icebreaker. This is the first in the series for 2024, and we will be hosting this series every other Thursday at noon, uh, January through March. So I hope you can join us again. Um, this icebreaker series is free to our community, thanks to our generous members and donors. And I'm sure I'm I'm speaking about some of you in the audience today. So thank you so much for your support. Um, and for those of you who are, are new to the Watershed Council, uh, just wanna share a little bit of information about us. Um, we're an environmental membership-based nonprofit. And this year we're celebrating 45 years of protecting and caring for our water resources in Northern Michigan. Uh, and with the help of, of many, uh, we work to preserve the truly irreplaceable lakes, uh, streams, and waters uh, that make Northern Michigan so unique. And we work locally uh, in watersheds within Antrim, Charlevoix, Sheboygan, and Emmett counties and throughout the Great Lakes Basin. And just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started and I turn this over to Marcella. Um, we will have all attendees muted uh, during the program and, and your uh, video will be turned off just to avoid any background noises. Um, so if you have a question, uh, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen, um, not the chat. So make sure you're using the Q&A function um, and we'll answer those questions at the end of the program unless there's something that we can do a quick pause for um, to Marcella, for Marcella to answer during the presentation. Um, so if we don't get to your, your questions uh, just due to time constraints, we'll follow up with you individually or you're welcome to reach out to us at the Watershed Council you can find all of us on the website and message us directly from the website. Um, lastly, this, this webinar is being recorded and we'll have it available on our website um, afterwards and we'll also post it on Facebook. Um, there'll be a survey at the end of the presentation today and we really would appreciate your feedback. It's what helps us to improve all of our programs here at the Watershed Council. And as always, um, virtual technology can always go wrong. Um, if we experience any technical difficulties during this presentation, um, we so appreciate your graciousness and patience as we work out any glitches. Um, you know, nothing can make you sweat like a hundred people watching you as you try to figure out what's going wrong with your presentation online. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, the talented uh, Marcella Domka. She's a water resources manager at Tip Limit Watershed Council and joined our team in May of 2023. She grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio with her parents and two sisters. She received her bachelor's of science degree in environmental biology from the University of Dayton, as well as her master's of science in fisheries and wildlife with a specialization in, in ecology, evolution and behavior from Michigan State University, go green. She worked as an intern studying nutrient pollution, microplastics and North American wildlife during her undergraduate career and developed a passion for the natural world from a young age. She has a strong interest in aquatic sciences, protection of freshwater resources, and wildlife conservation. And we really thank you today, Marcella, for joining us. I'll turn this presentation over to you. It's your turn. Great, I will just pull up my screen here and then we will get started. Um... <clears throat> All right, is everyone seeing just the primary slide and no speaker notes? Andrea, maybe you can confirm. Yes, yep. okay, that's good. Perfect. All right, um, so thank you so much for that introduction, Andrea. I am delighted to be the first icebreaker um, series speaker for this year. As Andrea mentioned, I have only been at the Watershed Council for about um, seven months, but I have immensely enjoyed my time here and um, everyone has been so lovely. So um, I will just get right into this presentation. And um, I did want to discuss before um, advancing to the next slide that this is my master's thesis research project. Um, so it is split into uh, two chapters. The first details uh, water quality comparisons between natural lakes and reservoirs. And then the second um, looks at waterfowl 
um, population differences between natural lakes and reservoirs. So there are two sort of sections. So if you're you know only interested in one, you can feel free to watch that one. Um, and you can tune in for both if you'd like. Uh, so without further ado, I will just go ahead and get started here. So to start off this thesis, um, we think about why we wanted to study reservoirs versus natural lakes and why we wanted to investigate the water quality differences between the two. So I want to kind of make a case for reservoirs and why we chose to study those. So reservoirs are bodies of water that provide many ecosystem services. Uh, such as flood control, irrigation, water supply, and recreation and tourism as well. Reservoirs are known to have large watersheds as well um, that facilitate the buildup and accumulation of both sediments and nutrients. Uh, so that is an important difference when we look to see if there are water quality differences between natural lakes and reservoirs. As well as having large watersheds, they are highly connected and I'll delve into that a bit more on the next slide. So when I say highly connected, we think of four different connectivity classifications. So ranging from the least to most connected, we have isolated and headwater uh, bodies of water, which are typically grouped in with natural lakes. So isolated, that connectivity class is just how it sounds. Um, and if you can see in the image on the left, it is a body of water that is completely isolated and has no inflows or outflows. Whereas a headwater um, natural lake or reservoir uh, has one primary outflow. And then we have drainage lakes and drainage lake lakes, um, which typically reservoirs are grouped into these two categories. Uh, a drainage lake, as you can see on the image to the left there, once again, um, it has inflows and outflows, but it typically does not have any um, upstream lakes greater than or equal to 10 hectares in size, whereas a drainage lake lake, that is the most highly connected um, of these four classes, that has, again, inflows and outflows, but it also has upstream lakes that are um, greater than or equal to 10 hectares, and it could be one upstream lake or multiple. In addition to reservoirs having many important um, ecological functions, they are also very common. So this is a figure from um, a paper that I was a co-author on in graduate school. You can see that um, reservoirs are very common, especially in Southern regions, um, and that they kind of dominate the, the South and Southwestern regions there. Um, you also might notice, and this isn't particularly relevant for my thesis, but we have two groupings of reservoirs, uh, Reservoir A and Reservoir B. Um, and the difference between those two is just that Reservoir B has um, a specific angularity that we rarely, if ever, see with natural lakes. And then a Reservoir A is um, just different than a natural lake, but doesn't have that specific angularity. And I'm going to get into the definition of a natural lake versus reservoir in just a few slides, uh, but I wanted to touch on that just in case anyone was looking at that figure and, and had some confusion. Um, so even though reservoirs are extremely common throughout the United States, they are um, understudied compared to natural lakes, and it's unknown whether natural lakes or reservoirs have better water quality. And definitions about reservoirs versus natural lakes are even unclear, uh, which is why I wanted to provide um, a slide and some imagery for you all. So according to the lab that I was a part of at MSU, the Data Intensive Landscape Limnology Lab, we have our own definitions of natural lake and reservoir that we use for our research. Um, so a natural lake is just like how the name sounds, naturally formed and either has no human interference or it may have a small human-made control um, structure that is meant to simply regulate water levels. Um, and you'll see there is a difference in shapes between the two. A reservoir, um, pictured on the right, has a characteristic dendritic shape is what we call it. It's very angular, um, not as rounded as a natural lake. So that's an important distinguishing feature. Uh, if I move my camera here real quick. Um, so a reservoir, in contrast, 
is not naturally formed. It's typically human constructed or has been significantly altered by humans. And it uh, typically has a water control structure that is meant to change or disrupt water flow. Um, and kind of bringing these definitions into our service area and um, the uh, northern area of Michigan's Lower Peninsula, some popular lakes uh, that are considered natural lakes or reservoirs according to our database. Um, Larks Lake, Lark Char Lake Charlevoix, those are considered natural lakes, whereas lakes such as Walloon or Torch Lake um, are considered reservoirs. So that is kind of to provide some context for um, our service area and kind of applying these, these definitions um, to, to the area where we work. Marcella? Yeah. We did have a quick question and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this off the top of your head. Yeah. Uh, but they mentioned on your map that the Great Salt Lake was character on your map, the Great Salt Lake was characterized as a reservoir. Mm. And they thought it might be a natural lake. Um, do you know if it's it's one or the other? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know why that would be. That's uh, the the database has you know four hundred ninety thousand some lakes. Um, so we did have classifications that were both manually done and then done by machine learning. So those were predictions. So it could be possible that. Um, that was done through machine learning, and that's how the machine, you know, classified um, the Great Salt Lake as as a reservoir. Um, it could be that there's some sort of human control structure or a dam or something that is um, directly impacting the flow of a water level there. So that would be my guess, my my best answer for that. Thanks, Marcella. Yeah, of course. Good question. All right, we'll move ahead here. So getting into the chapter one uh, research question, which concerned water quality and natural lakes and reservoirs, we just wanted to know how measures of water quality, as well as their drivers, so what is driving these differences, um, would compare between natural lakes and reservoirs. So how did we characterize water quality for this project? We looked at three common parameters used to measure water quality. The first being total phosphorus or TP, which is a limiting nutrient in aquatic ecosystems. So directly impacts productivity as well as plant growth. Um, chlorophyll A, which is an indicator of pelagic algal biomass. Um, again, a good indicator of productivity and algae growth, as well as water clarity. Um, sometimes I abbreviate it as WC. So, um, and that was measured via Secchi disk depth. I'm sure many people in the audience are familiar with the Secchi disk, um, but that essentially is just a tool on the right there um, that we lower into freshwater bodies to understand um, the transparency of the water. And that can, again, be an indicator of uh, overall productivity. So if you have a low Secchi disk depth reading and you know it's uh, the water's very opaque and you probably have a eutrophic um, lake or eutrophic conditions. And then if you're able to see that disc, you know, many feet below the water, that's indicative of um, an oligotrophic lake. So I also talked about drivers of these differences, if there are any differences in water quality between natural lakes and reservoirs. So I wanted to elaborate on what I mean by drivers here. Uh, this wants to, there we go. So we do have potential ecological drivers that would operate at different spatial scales. So when I showed that um, map with all the different reservoirs and natural lakes, you know, we do have almost 500,000 um, lakes in the United States. And so we need to think about different spatial scales that ecological drivers could be operating on. So the first um, scale would be at the lake, the individual lake level, then the watershed level. Um, where you have several different water bodies draining into a specific area, as well as a regional um, scale. And I'll, I'll define how we used region in this project in just a few slides, but that is um, the number of spatial scales we used from smallest to largest. And then when we think about what the drivers are, rather than just what scales they're operating at, uh, we think of first geomorphological factors, um, which would include uh, lake depth, um, hydrologic features such as dams, um, surface water and, I'm sorry, dams and surface water connectivity. Uh, so how connected water bodies are to one another. Um, land use, land cover or LULC. 
Um, so that would include factors such as urbanization, um, cultivated cropland or agricultural activities, wetland cover, and then climatic features, uh, which for this project, we used mean temperature as well as precipitation levels. So given all that background information, what were our preliminary expectations for how water quality differs between natural lakes and reservoirs? Well, I initially thought that uh, reservoirs would have higher total phosphorus and chlorophyll A concentrations, um, along with associated lower water clarity uh, based on the conventional understanding of uh, reservoirs and their human made nature. So like I mentioned, they're very connected. That's a greater opportunity for nutrient influx, higher levels of chlorophyll A and total phosphorus. They have larger watersheds, so they're receiving more input from other bodies of water. Excuse me. And they also are present in southern regions with warmer temperatures, um, as well as more precipitation. I also expected drivers at multiple spatial scales, um, such as temperature, land use and cover, and um, surface water connectivity to be influential in water quality differences between the two. Um, so we know that with, say, temperature, um, that's capable of increasing algal biomass with more urbanization and agricultural intensification. You could have greater nutrient pollution from um, fertilizers and runoff. And then um, I think I mentioned depth earlier, but I'm not going to go over my specific model that I used for depth in this presentation for the sake of time. But just as a, a small area of background, um, we know from liter previous literature that shallower lakes are more prone to phosphorus recycling. Uh, from lake bottom sediments to the epilimnion or the top layer of um, a body of freshwater. So that could be influential in determining water quality differences between the two as well. So I would like to discuss methodology and how we actually approached uh, this, this first chapter here. So this is a um, visualization, this is an overview of the data set that I used to complete this project. I mentioned I was part of the Data Intensive Landscape Limno Lab at MSU, and we have something called the Lagos US platform. Uh, Lagos stands for Lake Multiscale Geospatial and Temporal Database. And in that platform for this chapter, I used three core modules and one extension module um, to build models and understand results uh, for this first chapter. So. The first core module I used is Lagos US Geo. Um, that includes variables such as urbanization, a percentage of wetland cover, um, percentage of cultivated cropland. Uh, so that gives kind of, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, geographical context uh, for this study. I also use Lagos US Locus. That provides um, lake location and lake characteristic data. Um, so sort of, um, geo geometric features like lake perimeter, lake island area, um, lake total area. I use Lagos US Limno as the last core module. Uh, so that has epilimnian data for total phosphorus, total nitrogen, chlorophyll A. Um, and I believe uh, maybe that's it, but yeah, so those are the three core modules. And then the extension module I used here, I did use depth as well as reservoir, but I'm only covering reservoir since I didn't include the depth models here. Um, so Lagos US Reservoir just provides that uh, classification variable that uses either manual predictions or machine learning predictions um, to classify all of those lakes in the US as either natural lakes or reservoirs based on those previous definitions. Um, so this study really was rooted in reservoir and limno data, and um, you'll see a bit more of this on the next slide, but our total sample size was 3,286 lakes um, over a time span of 23 years, 1997 to 2020. Um, the reason that the study size was uh, 3,200 rather than 480,000 80, lakes is that I used uh, limnological data from um, the northeastern area only. I used 
data that was only collected um, during the summer stratification period where we were able to um, collect limno data. And I also used data that um, had values for all three variables for each lake. So I wanted um, total phosphorus, chlorophyll A, as well as secchi depth readings. So there are gaps in the data set. So that's why the um, sample size was much smaller. So that leads into our study extent and um, a visualization of all the lakes that were included in this data set. So like I said, the uh, final sample size after um, um, analyzing all the summer stratified data and, and imposing all those limitations on the whole data set um, was 3,286. And as you can see, um, like I said, I mentioned um, the Lagos Limno Northeast data. So that only has data for the uh, 17 uh, most Northeastern states in the United States. So um, that's why it is confined to this spatial extent here. So now that you've seen all the lakes that um, I used in this chapter one study set, we can get into um, breaking them down by lake class, connectivity, as well as neon zones. Um, so of the 3,286 lakes, we had 1,514 natural lakes and 1,772 reservoirs, and that's shown on the left there. Uh, reservoirs were prevalent everywhere in the study extent, but really dominating the southern regions, as you can see. Um, we had all four of those connectivity classes in the data set, but there were very few headwater and isolated lakes compared to drainage lakes and drainage lake lakes, um, especially along the southern part of the extent once again. Um, in terms of the NEON zones, that is the regional variable that we used here. NEON stands for um, National Ecological Observatory Network. And that was able to, um, those are these, these kind of polygons that you see um, in both the left and right maps here. And that was um, to break down the uh, lake study set by region in which each of these neon zones has distinct ecoclimatic eco domains. So um, distinct, you know, maybe biomes or, um, regional or temperature conditions. Hopefully I explained that well there, but um, so we had kind of three different classifications of lake class connectivity and neon zone. So diving right into our results for chapter one, uh, we have this really fun figure here, a very large box plot. Um, so what I'm really showing here is a box plot that is comparing total phosphorus concentrations by lake class and neon zone. Um, the y-axis is showing uh, total phosphorus and micrograms per liter. Um, and each box is indicating natural lake or reservoir, natural lake in blue, reservoir in orange. Uh, so what is this box plot showing us? We want to know if water quality is differing by lake type. So the answer to that is yes. So as you can see here with these red boxes, we see that total phosphorus concentrations um, in micrograms per liter varied by region and were significantly higher overall in reservoirs as compared to natural lakes. I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen, but in the bottom right corner of the figure, um, you can see that the mean TP concentration was significantly higher than um, in reservoirs than the mean TP concentration for natural lakes, um, particularly in zones, uh, neon zones five, nine and six. Um, and I'm only showing total phosphorus results here, but uh, chlorophyll A and secchi readings followed suit. Uh, we saw higher chlorophyll A um, readings, significantly higher chlorophyll A readings in reservoirs. And then we saw lower water clarity, which is expected if you have higher nutrient levels um, in reservoirs. So this was in accordance with my expectations for this chapter. Um, and if anyone is uh, looking at these neon zones down here on the x-axis, um, they are numbered uh, ecologically from the furthest northeast to southwest uh, based on the least presence of reservoir reservoirs to the most um, and the similar ecological conditions from north to south. Um, so that's why they're not, you know, labeled one through 
I think we have seven. Um, so just in case anyone was trying to interpret that. So we had our preliminary answers for uh, whether total phosphorus, uh, chlorophyllite, and secchi differed by lake type. And so we wanted to understand as well um, what ecological drivers were influencing those results. So we built uh, GLMs or generalized linear models um, in order to understand what factors were the most influential. So in our sample size of 3,286 lakes, we saw that reservoirs had significantly higher total phosphorus, chlorophyll A, and lower water clarity. Other significant drivers um, of these variable differences were region, connectivity, land use and land cover, as well as temperature. So um, I'll use temperature as an example. What we saw from our model results is that as temperature increased, we saw subsequent increases in total phosphorus and chlorophyll A, along with um, lower water clarity, which is to be expected. Uh, so that means that uh, temperature, along with those other three significant drivers, um, those all had an impact in um, determining whether water quality was different between natural lakes and reservoirs. So some reasoning behind this, um, this is just kind of a brief overview, but if you think about connectivity being a significant driver, um, the more connected you are to other water bodies of water, the more nutrient influx um, that a reservoir could be susceptible to. Region as a significant driver uh, with poor water quality in southwestern regions due to um, increased levels of uh, precipitation. It's warmer, wetter, um, mostly reservoirs, so region is going to be um, an influential factor here. Land use and land cover. Um, nutrient loading could be uh, facilitated by stormwater, urbanization, and agriculture. Uh, so that could be a reason that uh, land use and land cover is playing such a significant uh, role in these final results. And then lastly, temperature. Um, we know that temperature uh, for lakes has quite a big impact on water column stratification and primary production. So with increased temperatures, it makes sense that we saw um, greater algal biomass and greater levels of nutrients. So these overall conclusions for this first chapter, we know that reservoirs have significantly poorer water quality compared to natural lakes with higher total phosphorus and chlorophyll A and lower water clarity and that there are a variety of ecological drivers at different scales that influence water quality, including, um, well, lake depth, but again, I didn't cover that model, uh, but region, connectivity, temperature, et cetera. Um, so studying these reservoirs, this can facilitate lake management and conservation efforts. We can work to preserve ecosystem services with this knowledge in mind, and um, we have more available knowledge for management of eutrophication and HABs, and we can think that or we can apply different principles to reservoirs versus natural lakes, um, as according to this research, they are more susceptible to nutrient influx. All right, so getting into chapter two, and I'll try and move through this one a little more quickly so there's time for questions at the end. Um, my overarching research question for chapter two uh, concerned how do waterfall populations compare between natural lakes and reservoirs? And there's a very cute image at the bottom there. Um, so overall, we don't know whether waterfowl populations are higher in natural lakes or reservoirs. And there's very little research as to what ecological drivers are influencing their populations at the macro scale. So this was also quite understudied, um, similar to chapter one. So for anyone that is unfamiliar, waterfowl re refers to birds that are found in aquatic habitats, such as lakes, reservoirs, and wetlands. Um, they typically utilize natural lakes and reservoirs for breeding grounds or nesting, migratory grounds, feeding and foraging, and oh, yeah, and um, lake island area, which is an important variable that I'll get into in just a bit. Uh, there are many factors that can affect waterfowl populations. So factors that would affect their breeding and survival could include climate, uh, so drier conditions, increased evapotranspiration or warmer temperatures um, is going to have an impact on their survival. Lake characteristics such as lake morphometry, 
um, pH or acidity, nutrient levels, island area that they may use for foraging, breeding, uh, landscape features such as urbanization or agriculture, wetlands, uh, protected areas such as reserves or managed habitats, as well as region, um, in this case BCRs or bird conservation regions, which are shown here on the right uh, in this first picture. Uh, BCRs are ecologically distinct regions in um, North America that consist of similar bird communities and habitat composition, um, as well as resource, resource management concerns. And then lake water quality, of course, uh, which has been the crux of chapter one. Um, from previous research, we do know that there could be a bi-directional linkage between water quality and waterfowl populations. So what that means is waterfowl are capable of degrading water quality uh, through unintentional import of nutrients. However, on the other hand, eutrophication and increased level of nutrients can provide a very desirable habitat to many waterfowl species as there's greater availability of food resources. So overall, we don't know whether these um, associations are mechanistic or in what direction they're occurring. Um, and we don't know how these, how these associations differ between natural lakes or reservoirs. So my research question and expectations for chapter two, I wanted to know um, whether waterfowl population densities differ by lake type. And I expected uh, reservoirs to have greater waterfowl population densities compared to natural lakes. Um, that is due to the poorer water quality with reservoirs that we found uh, in chapter one. Um, higher total phosphorus, higher chlorophyll A, um, that would attract birds for breeding, nesting, and feeding. And eutrophic conditions could provide that desirable habitat space for many species. We also wanted to know if particular species were more likely in natural lakes or reservoirs. Um, so by particular species, I'm referring to nuisance species or um, species of conservation concern. So we expected nuisance species to be more common um, in reservoirs. An example of a nuisance species in this database would be that photo on the top there, uh, the mute swan. Um, I'm sure many people are familiar with the mute swan, um, but they have a, a wide they have an ability to tolerate a wide range of population of, I'm sorry, of habitat conditions. Um, they may take advantage of any type of food resource. Uh, so we expected to see um, higher populations of nuisance species in reservoirs. And then with rare species or species of um, conservation concern, um, I think if I'm remembering right, the only one of those in my data set was the American black duck, and I'll go over all the species in my data set in just a second. But um, for these species, uh, they are more specialist or more specialized, and they have less of a tolerance for poor water quality conditions. They may need more um, specific freshwater conditions to really thrive. I also asked, um, are waterfowl population densities changing over time and according to lake type? So there's quite a few research questions in this second chapter here. Um, the answer to that is we, we're really not sure, completely understudied. Um, so I will get into that uh, in just a few slides. And then finally, I wanted to know what climatic lake and landscape factors are associated with differences in waterfowl densities between the lake types. And my kind of prediction for this was that it would be a combination of lake, landscape, and climate features um, that would influence the densities based on our understanding of waterfowl biology and behavior, um, their feeding and foraging behaviors, their nesting and breeding preferences. I had to do a lot of um, background research on each species to find out you know, which ones are more tolerant of certain conditions and which ones have strong preferences um, for oligotrophic versus eutrophic lakes. So we really expected to see quite a combination of ecological drivers um, influencing these results. So the data we used here is once again uh, from the Lagos US platform. I used GEO for those ecological drivers, LOCUS for the geometric characteristics, reservoir to uh, classify lakes as natural lakes or reservoirs, 
And then I used an additional extension module called Bogos US Landsat. Um, that has chlorophyll A data um, from satellite imagery um, for lakes greater than or equal to four hectares uh, from the years 1984 to 2019. Um, so that is where I got chlorophyll A data uh, for this um, second, second chapter here. And um, that lined up nicely with our, um, what am I trying to say here? Our, our data span. Um, so the waterfowl data, I went over the lake data, but where did I get the species data from? So um, this data is from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it is called the Atlantic Flyway Breeding Waterfowl Survey, um, or the AFBWS. Um, so as you can see on the left here, we have um, 1,234 waterfowl sampling plots in which the total individual birds was recorded. Um, those are one kilometer squared plots, and I'll go into a bit more uh, detail about that. And then on the right, um, you can see that we have six different BCRs circled. So again, the BCRs are the bird conservation regions, and those are the ones that overlapped with the data here on the left, uh, so we could understand regional influence on the waterfowl data. So in order to merge the lake data with the waterfowl data, we had to kind of think of a, a creative way to associate those with one another. Um, so using GIS, we plotted um, uh, a buffer shapefile, which uh, the buffers are these little donut shaped um, images right here. Uh, so those are buffers within 500 meters of a Lagos US lake. And then we overlaid the waterfowl data um, and selected plots that fell within either 500 meters of a natural lake, which are indicated in blue, or a reservoir. And after performing that analysis, the final, oh, you know what, that is in a couple slides, but um, I will reiterate the final um, sample size after performing that merge after this slide. Um, so I did say I would discuss study species from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service data. Um, those are all listed on the left there. I'm sure many of these species are familiar to you. I mentioned the mute swan, American black duck, uh, Canada goose, as well as the um, hooded merganser and the common merganser as well. So I must have gotten those slides a bit about a bit out of order, but what I was going to say um, two slides ago is that after performing that merge with GIS, um, we had a total sample size of 336 waterfowl plots that fell within 500 meters of either a natural lake or reservoir. And then for the lakes that had Landsat or chlorophyll A data, um, that was a subset of 135 lakes. So to answer this first question of whether population densities were different for any of the species um, across natural lakes versus reservoirs, uh, we made this big fun box plot here. So this box plot shows population densities by lake class uh, for all 10 species in the waterfowl survey data. Um, the y-axis is showing densities and the x um, axis is species by lake class. Um, so we performed a t-test on these um, densities to find that um, only two populations uh, were significantly different in natural lakes versus reservoirs. And that was um, that mallards and wood ducks were both more um, common in reservoirs. So for our model results, um, before we got into another set of generalized linear models, we performed presence or absence models, uh, which is just like what it sounds. Um, so we wanted to see, based on that sample size of 336 lakes, if certain species were more likely to be found um, in natural lakes or reservoirs. So we found three species were significant with these models. 
Um, mallards being more likely to be present in reservoirs with a p-value of 0.02. Uh, wood ducks also being more likely to be found in reservoirs. Um, this was marginally significant with a p-value of 0.08. And then common mergansers were less likely to be found in reservoirs with a p-value of 0.05. So some biological reasoning behind these results. Uh, when we think of wood ducks, we thought of wood duck foraging and feeding behaviors. Um, they commonly feed on aquatic plants that are found in eutrophic environments, and they have higher energetic demands compared to other species. Uh, for mallards, they are known to thrive in a wide variety of habitats. Um, they are known to be susceptible to poor water quality and higher nutrient levels as well. So this kind of invoked the idea that they may have a threshold of tolerance uh, where they can withstand a certain amount of eutrophication and excess nutrients, but only to a certain point. And then with common mergansers, uh, we know that they tend to forage and winter on large, clear oligotrophic lakes. Um, they are fish eating or piscivorous birds that are high in the aquatic food chain. Um, and they can also serve as bioindicators of environmental health and overall lake toxin levels. Um, so they clearly have that preference for more pristine lakes, which is why we may have seen um, higher populations in natural lakes. Uh, addressing that third question of how species uh, population densities have changed over time. Um, this is through the year 2000 through 2020. Um, this is our mallard data showing that mallards declined, mallard population densities declined in both um, natural lakes and reservoirs over time. Wood ducks uh, increased in both natural lakes and reservoirs over time. And then finally with common mergansers, we saw, um, oops, I'm sorry, um, an increase in natural lakes and a decrease in reservoirs over that 20 years, 20 year time span. So what do those scatter plots really tell us? Um, what we learned from that is that the population density change over 20 years depended on species and lake type. Um, with the common mergansers increasing in natural lakes and decreasing in reservoirs, uh, we know that maybe because reservoirs have poorer water quality and higher nutrient concentrations, and those mergansers may be sensitive to eutrophication and factors associated with that. Um, with the mallard population decline in both lake types, uh, we would probably need future research to understand um, if the mallard decreases are related to decreases in water quality. And again, that threshold of tolerance, if they can tolerate those poor um, nutrient conditions for a specific period of time before it becomes overwhelming. And then um, wood ducks, we saw increases in natural lakes and reservoirs over time for that species. Um, but it should be noted that all of these trends were not particularly strong through time um, with the exception of mallard population densities declining in reservoirs. Um, so maybe the main takeaway from this is that you know, more research is needed um, on their population densities over time with changing ecological conditions. Finally, the last sort of bit of modeling we did here um, was the generalized linear models on that subset of 135 lakes. Um, so our results here are in the form of a chart. So I detailed the percent of variation explained for each species, as well as which drivers um, were significant and marginally significant. So if you see um, a certain variable is um, colored like BCR, that just means it was significant across um, more than one species. Um, but as you can see, there were some drivers that were significant for one species and not for another, such as chlorophyll A and cultivated crops um, being significant drivers for mallards, but not for wood ducks or common mergansers. Um, and interestingly, there were no variables that were significant across all three waterfowl species, which kind of further confirms the idea that these population density trends and the ecological drivers are very species dependent. 
So some reasoning behind these uh, GLM model results. With greater chlorophyll A, um, we saw, I'm sorry, with more eutrophic conditions, we saw those increases with mallards um, in some of these some of these questions for chapter two. And that could again be related to that bi-directional linkage that I was discussing. Uh, with the bird conservation regions, um, these habitats are very susceptible to eutrophication and cyanotoxins as well, which could lead to um, waterfowl mortality. There's increased urbanization in these areas, loss of submerged aquatic vegetation and habitat fragmentation as well. Oops, um, I wanted to see if there's anything else to say. Martella, we've just got a couple minutes left um, yeah. to make for questions. So uh, sure. Rush, you just wanna make sure we stay on time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Andrea. Um, I may skip over this slide here just for the sake of time. Um, but thinking about climate as an ecological driver, it can influence many, many waterfowl um, activities such as breeding. Oh, a lot more information here than I thought. Okay, um, so our conclusions for chapter two, most species did not differ between reservoirs and natural lakes. Trends through time as well as ecological drivers were species dependent. And this is all important information for the future management and conservation of waterfowl. And we need further studying of drivers and patterns through time. Our overall thesis conclusions, I wanna skip over this, I apologize. Um, I did want to get to this slide about um, Northern Lower Michigan. I wanted to tie in these results with our service area. Um, so with our service area specifically, water bodies classified as reservoirs may need to be managed differently since they may be more susceptible to nutrient inputs. Um, with region and temperature and climate, you know, we are in an area uh, with the Great Lakes. So with lake effect and a decline in ice coverage, um, there could be a lot of climate-based changes uh, in the near future that could kind of facilitate some unforeseen environmental challenges. Um, we also have uh, issues with uh, invasive species, whether they're in inland lakes or um, the Great Lakes themselves. Um, so what was the point I wanted to make there? Um, we could see that these are capable of decreasing water quality or um, even changing overall water quality like with zebra and quagga mussels, how they feed on those excess nutrients. Um, for our organization specifically, the Watershed Council, we can use this information to continue to maintain our high quality waters, um, use waterfowl as bioindicators of um, water quality and toxin levels, continue with long-term data collection and analysis for our inland lakes, um, and continue with restoration efforts that the Watershed Council already undertakes. Uh, those were acknowledgements. Okay, I apologize that was so long. I will take any questions now. It wasn't not long at all. Fascinating, okay. Marcella. Thank you so much. I, I'm sure oh, that was an you. incredible amount of research and work <laughs> to complete that. I uh, I can't believe you you accomplished that. Oh, thank um, you. Andrew. So just a a couple questions. You know, I think a few of the first questions were really about the classifications of, of natural lakes versus reservoirs. Yeah. And I'm not sure which map the, these comments are referring to. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a map at the beginning of your presentation um, mm -hmm. where they question uh, whether or not Torch Lake and Balloon Lake were um, how they were classified and if they're classified correctly. I'm not sure how they zoomed in on that map mm. to see those. Um, <laughs> but they, they specific questions about Torch Lake and Walloon Lake formed by glaciers making them natural lakes versus reservoirs. Yeah, so um, it's not necessarily about the formation process all the time. It could be the presence of a water control structure. Um, so it could have to do with a dam or some other sort of structure that regulates water levels. Uh, so it could be that the lake was naturally formed, and typically that is exclusive to natural lakes. But you could have a reservoir that was um, formed by a glacier retreat, and then you know now there's some sort of structure that directly um, controls water levels that would make it a reservoir by our classification process. But I should emphasize our definitions are not like 100% the catch-all. So um, that's what we use in our research lab, but I'm sure that um, maybe by other standards, they would be considered a natural lake, but we we just used our, our machine learning and manual learning to do that. 
Okay. And I, I would ask anyone who um, has an additional question about how their lake is classified, if you want to reach out to Marcella directly, um, I'm sure she can do a little bit of research and get that information for you. Yeah. Uh, so Robert, if you want more information about Glen Lake or something in Leelanau County, let's um, let's get that to Marcella directly. Uh, there was this is not quite a question, but a comment. Perhaps you have something to reflect on it for um, a comment about invasive mussels greatly impacting all of all of the measures you're you're mentioning, hmm. um, and if they skew your assessments to more favorable conditions than they're actually present. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I I only kind of thought about invasive species when I was trying to relate this research to our service area. I didn't really. Um, have any variables that directly concern invasive species for uh, my graduate school project, but um, actually my my coworker in graduate school, her whole thesis was about uh, zebra mussels. So I think it's there's a possibility that that data is um, skewing some results, but that would probably require a, a pretty intense um, analysis similar to, to my coworker. She was looking at boat launches and um, zebra mussel populations. So yeah, I know that they are certainly capable of um, changing water quality when they're feeding on, um, you know, smaller nutrients. So that that's a, a good comment. I'm not sure how much I have to say on it, though. Okay, hey, um, another comment. Um, some reservoirs allow for access, um, access for recreation. Mm -hmm. Some do not. Um, and would that make an impact, uh, you know, how those differ with nutrients and other factors? Yeah, um, I'm not sure how much of an impact that would have on nutrient concentrations. I feel like nutrient concentration increase is primarily based on um, non-point source pollution and influx from, you know, connected, um, other connected water bodies. So if it were just based on tourism, I'm not, I can't think off the top of my head how like just recreational activities would increase nutrients, but it could be a possibility. Uh, a question for Catherine. Um, in your box plot, mm -hmm. uh, she mentioned that it doesn't look as though phosphorus was consistently higher in reservoirs than in lakes. Could mm -hmm. you go over that plot again? Yeah, absolutely. So it was only higher um, in neon zones five, nine, and six. Uh, so let me look at my notes here. Um, overall, however, our mean across the entire box plot um, had it was higher in reservoirs as compared to natural lakes not a huge difference but there was a significantly higher total phosphorus concentration um, so where we saw those significant differences could certainly be based on region um, again those those specific neon zones um, and does that answer the question it could be it could be region specific uh, another question um, just mentions that a fundamental element of your presentation is the def the definitions of reservoir versus natural lake, mm -hmm. and that your definitions um, might differ from their past experience. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, impoundment was not discussed. I'm wondering if you yeah. can just uh, discuss why you use those two definitions and how you differentiate. Um. So why I use them and how they're reservoir versus natural lake. Yeah. Um. So we kind of came up with these definitions from a research paper from 2021. Um, those definitions were already in place before I joined the lab. So I don't have a ton of information for how those were developed, but um, I know a huge part of the reservoir definition is um, the artificial side of things or the human constructed side of things. Again, it's not a catch-all. Like I said, there could be um, reservoirs that may have been naturally formed but now function as reservoirs based on a water control structure. The main point of differentiation is probably the artificial nature of the reservoir as well as the presence of a water control structure that specifically disrupts or alters the flow of water. A natural lake could have a water structure but um, it will not directly disrupt the flow of water. That is my understanding of it. Okay. Um, just a quick comment from John um, mentions that often a lot of dead trees uh, can be found standing in flooded reservoirs that provide nesting habitats for wood ducks. Mm. And that might be a factor as to why wood ducks are more prevalent in reservoirs uh, mm. according to results. Yeah, absolutely. That's super interesting. Yeah. And then, and then lastly, um, we had a guest who had a question. 
if there was any consideration consideration for parasitic drivers on the duck, duck population densities. Hmm. Um, not in my research, but that is definitely an area to look into. Um, thinking about, yeah, when I was, when I kind of first started here, I was learning more about swimmer's itch and the role mergansers play in that. So, um, yeah, I wasn't really, I didn't have that in mind when researching, um, the waterfowl in grad school, but that's an area of interest for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like there's, um, quite a few questions just Maybe we can follow up offline on some of these. I know we want to be conscious of sticking to the time. Sure. Um, you know, questions on if you considered how carp might impact water quality, cabs, mm -hmm. or um, percentage of developed shorelines were considerations. Um, I think we can get into those a little bit further, unless you have any quick comments off the top of your head. Um, not off the top of my head, but I am happy to take any um questions over email. My email and direct line is here. So um, it sounds like people had a lot of interest in the topic or have some clarifying questions. So um, I'm in the office five days a week. So I can I can certainly take any of those questions over phone or email. Okay. Everyone loves their lake. We know that. <laughs> we have plenty of questions about their particular lake. So if anyone sure. wants to reach out to Marcella for more information, please call or email um, the Watershed Council. We'll be sure to follow up with you directly. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to quickly um, close this out here. If I can share my little closing screen. Hoping you can see that. Mm -hmm. um, join us, please, for the, for the next meeting on uh, January 25th, where we'll be discussing PFAS, the biggest environmental crisis in 40 years and the impact specifically in northern Michigan with Christian Bond. And then in February, we'll be sp uh, speaking about the weakening of the Clean Water Act and what that means for Michigan's wetlands with Ted Lossi. Um, I hope you can join us for both of those as well as the continuation of the series. Of course, we're always looking for volunteers. So if you have any interest in, in joining us specifically, um, we're looking for some volunteer stream and lake monitors. Um, so if you have any interest to just reach out to us here at the Watershed Council. And lastly, of course, all of you are to thank for, for us being able to offer these wonderful programming, educational programs for the community. Um, if you're not already, please uh, consider becoming a member and supporting our mission here at the Watershed Council. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Marcella. Fantastic job. And we look forward to seeing everyone in two weeks for our next presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, and stay tuned. You'll get an automatic uh, survey that pops up after you close out. Um, please consider sending some feedback for us. Thank you. <laughs>